Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. Join the American Homebrewers Association in November and claim an out-of-this-world offer. Use discount code 5STAR, all one word, to receive a free 32-ounce bottle of IO Star sanitizer when you purchase a one-year membership. Get your free IO Star with promo code 5STAR and find holiday inspiration for great gifts, craft beer recipes, beer and food pairing suggestions, and much more by visiting homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing today. Hurry, this offer won't last. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing for offer details. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 30th, 2023. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we have a special guest for the first time on our recipe development series. Josh Secor from Gambit Brewing Company in St. Paul, Minnesota, joins Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin and me to taste Kentucky Commons, both Josh's and mine, and design a recipe for Matt's holiday beer. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who was helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And financial supporters have already seen the video episode that I'm planning to post this Friday. It's the one about the uh, Kentucky Common that we'll be tasting on this show alongside Josh's commercial version. We didn't get to taste Josh's on the show, on the video show, but, but you do get to see mine. Financial supporters also got the recipe and a behind-the-scenes video of how the beer came together. Financial supporters will also get to see a very special video that Steve and I are planning to shoot next week. I uh, dug into the archives and unearthed the main video from our original Introduction to Extract home brewing video that I think was shot in 2004. We're planning to do a sort of a DVD commentary and record ourselves watching our uh, watching ourselves brew that first beer in Studio A. That's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and I'm not planning to release that uh, to the public for like six months. Uh, so get it, get it while you can. I'm also planning to send that video out to participants of the annual Brewing Disasters show. Uh, I'm starting to get letters in, and they're good ones. Stories of brew, well, or bad, depending on. <laughs> <laughs> They're stories of brewing gone wrong that Steve Wilkes and I will read uh, at the end of the year. No blood yet, thank goodness. Knock wood. So that uh, that disaster show bingo card uh, space is unchecked. Uh, not sure when we're going to record that uh, disaster show, so please get your disaster stories in to me uh, while you're thinking about it. Send them to james at basicbrewing.com. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. If you celebrate American Thanksgiving, that is our our family Thanksgiving meal in Hot Springs was the was the smallest one yet, sadly, uh, to due to uh, people who were working out of town and and uh, we've lost one or two uh, since last year. Um, so of course the smallest yet, not counting COVID times. Of course, we did have a great time though, spending time with those who could gather together. We, for the first time, we had store bought smoked turkey. Already a whole turkey that was already smoked, and it was delicious. Uh, early this week, we had a visit from our good friends, Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com. They made the trip from Tulsa to northwest Arkansas, and we got to go to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Ozark Beer Company, West Mountain Brewing, and we ate at the new Fayetteville location of Flyway Brewing, uh, which we will feature Next week on the show, and we did an interview. Steve and I did an interview with uh, head brewer Court Castleberry. Uh, Steve and his wife Gretchen got to join us for supper at Flyway. We had a great time and even did a little antiquing uh, the day after <laughs> here in Prairie Grove. This is off topic, but I found a vintage Hidden Valley Ranch dressing shaker for five bucks. Most of you probably won't remember what that is, but but way back in the day when ranch dressing first came out, you had to buy this powder and add your own buttermilk and mayonnaise. It wasn't, you know, already in a pourable form. Mom had one of those shaker things. She must have sent off for it, uh, but it looked like a Tupperware little shaker thing with a with a green lid, 
And now I have one. <laughs> I'm going to have to make some uh, some old school ranch dressing and see if it tastes different from the uh, the pre-made kind. I'll let you know. <laughs> As if you want to know. <laughs> some of you will know. Some of you will remember the old uh, shaker things. Anyway, uh, Desiree and Dave wanted me to tell you that they're having their annual sale on money at HighGravityBrew.com. Every year they sell gift certificates for 10% off, and that discount is applied at checkout, so you don't have to have a code or anything. You can get gift certificates in increments of 10 25 50 100 and $500, but for the first time they're offering a $1,000 gift certificate. They did that because last year a brewer bought enough gift certificates to buy an electric brewing system and save 10%. So for those of you who want to do that, Desiree and Dave have made it easier with the larger denomination uh, gift certificate. You can use your discounted gift certificate to buy ingredient kits like the 2023 Revelry and Merriment Holiday Ale or a Warthog electric controller or a turnkey system designed to take the pain out of propane. A 10% discounted gift certificate is a great way for Santa it gives you something that you really like instead of, you know, vulgar socks or something. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with it. Discounted gift certificates are only available for a limited time. So get yours now at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, this was a great conversation. I always say that, but this is a lot of fun. Let's talk with Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin with our very special guest, Josh Secor from Gambit Brewing in St. Paul. Matt Giovanisi, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you for having me. We have a special guest. For the first time ever on our recipe development series, we have a third. We have a special guest, Mr. Josh Secor of Gambit Brewing Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome, Josh. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Now, why, why are you here? How did you get into this conversation? Remind us. So... I was working along in the brewery one day, brewing, I think an Imperial Stout was what I was brewing that day, uh, listening to the podcast, and you guys went into the whole recipe development show about the Kentucky Common. And it's a style that I don't see out a lot, um, but we happen to brew on a gambit that we've been doing pretty consistently uh, since we opened in January at Gambit, and then I brewed it previously Um at another brewery I worked at before. So uh, it's like, oh, that's interesting. I'll see what these guys come up with. And lo and behold, the recipe you guys came up with was pretty close to what I brew at Gambit. So <laughs> Credibility. I an email and said, hey, maybe, maybe you guys would want to try what I'm doing. And, you know, this sort of, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And you generously sent us uh, not only your uh, Kentucky Common called Backwoods Lullaby, but you sent us a bonus beer that I hope that we'll have time uh, to sample. If we don't have time in the air, uh, we're going to drink it uh, otherwise. Yeah. But, <laughs> Fair but, enough. but hopefully we'll, we'll uh, get to it. Uh, so, Josh, tell you only opened in January. Tell us about Gambit. Yeah, so Gambit, we're a small uh, brewery in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, we just opened up in January, so we're coming up on our one-year anniversary. Um it's been uh, it's been a pretty exciting thing, but we we have a uh, I have eleven beers on tap all the time, and we do a a naked hard seltzer that then we we flavor by the glass more cocktail style than white claw style for a seltzer. Um, but we kind of kind of follow the the model of the not really the old school brew pub, but we have a lot of residential in the same building that we're in, and a lot of residential around our neighborhood, so. I try and keep a little bit of something for everybody on tap all the time. Cool. Um, yeah. So, so you get to see uh, some of the regulars all the time who live around oh, for nearby. Sure. Yep, definitely for sure. Yeah, that sounds fun. And and your your concept of the cocktail seltzer, I think maybe maybe even that would warm the cold cold heart of Chris Colby, the uh, seltzer <laughs> skeptic, because that sounds uh, fairly tasty. What are some examples of some cocktail recipes that you make uh, with your seltzer? So we go anywhere from like a blueberry basil um, syrup. We do an orange cordial that comes out kind of like a dreamsicle. And then we have some that are more like 
back to childhood. So like a tropical punch and uh, a blue raspberry, uh, a blue raspberry when it comes up super blue, but we float a, a Swedish fish in it, um, like a kind of like an old school fish bowl. So, mm. uh, <laughs> and then we're always trying to kind of, it, we, you know, the bartenders and the brewer, you know, we can all sort of, uh, you come up with a good idea, make a little test batch of syrup and see how it goes. You know, it's, it's a really collaborative uh, thing that we're trying to do. And what, how creative do you get with your beer styles? I mean, do you, I, I assume you said that this, uh, uh, the backwoods lullaby, the K- Kentucky common is a, is a staple, uh, style, yeah. right? But yeah. what, what else do you do that's, uh, that's interesting and fun? So we do, I do, I mean, you, if you want to have a brewery, you have to brew hazies. That's just kind of the rules, which is fine mm-hmm. with me. I, I, I love the hazies. Um, and then we'll do some some interesting flavor, kind of smaller batch flavored stuff. So right now I have, I actually was thinking about something similar for the holiday beer that we may talk about, um, a cranberry orange pale ale for the Thanksgiving week that mm. kind of pairs well with all that stuff. I have a uh, watermelon and hibiscus sour beer on tap right now mm. that I think will be interesting. And then for like Christmas, there's a, a strawberry and jasmine tea beer that we're going to put out for Christmas time. So, um, you know, it's nothing like, I don't do a, like, I don't do the super like lambics and, and that kind of sours. It's more of the, the super fruity Florida vice kind of style sours. Mm-hmm. And the lagers, we do, we do lagers and we do a little bit of everything, which makes it kind of fun. Yeah. So, Josh, Josh, uh, tell us about your Kentucky Common. Why did you decide? I mean, you're not in Kentucky. Uh, why did you decide to go with uh, that style? So, we do it as for us. It's it's a really great gateway beer. So we have a blonde on. We have a pilsner on most of the time. So the people that come in, I don't know how familiar you are with Minnesota, but Michelob Golden Light is like the beer. If you're not a you know if you're a macro drinker, you're drinking Mick Golden Lights. Um, so when we get the people that come in with their friends to the brewery, to the tap room, and all they want is that busy yellow, you know, Bud Miller Coors, mm-hmm. we usually say, hey, okay, we can give you a blonde. You'll like the blonde. You'll like the Pilsner. But try a sampler of this beer. Try a sampler of this Kentucky Common. It's approachable enough that a regular light beer drinker can drink it, but then it kind of gives them the – Oh, I'm at a brewer. I'm drinking craft beer. I'm kind of doing the, I'm doing the thing. So, um, we've kind of won over a lot of craft drinkers just by pushing them a little, just a, that little step outside of their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then if you know, you'll have the people that look at it and say it's too dark. It's going to be bitter, or it's I don't like dark beer. The, you know, this can kind of cure that because it looks like more than it drinks. We we kind of call it like the ultimate craft lawnmower beer. <laughs> I just poured yours and I had poured mine from the keg earlier and I'll probably take a picture for Instagram. I'm trying to hold trying to find a piece of paper that I can hold it up against. The color yours has a little bit more of a kind of a ruby red hue mm-hmm. than mine. Mine is or ours, Matt. Yeah. Uh ours is a little more brown. Um but yeah, there is a, there is there, I'm there's sorry. not much difference in it though. I don't think. No, from appearance, like I say, there is a there is a ruby red, uh, you know, toward the. I've got a tapered sort of uh, goblet uh, mm-hmm. glass. I don't know what you call it, but any, with a stem on it, and toward the bottom where it's you know there's less less area of beer to look through, you yeah. know, you can tell that there is a, you know, kind of a more of a reddish hue uh, coming mm-hmm. through. So. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure which one to sample. I'm going to sample yours first. Uh, Matt, okay. have you been sampling both while while we've been talking? I, I've been waiting patiently to sample. Oh. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be the only one drinking. Oh, I'm guilty. I've been sampling them both. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Josh, maybe may, uh, give give Matt and me a t- uh, some time to uh, uh, to to sample and and sure. give 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 us your impressions of, mm. of of you know compare and contrast. Be nice, uh, but compare and contrast to between the two. Flavor-wise, I, there's not a, there's not a ton of difference between them. There's a little bit of a like a sweeter aroma on yours, I think, than than mine. But 
like flavor wise, they're they're pretty they're pretty close. I think they're both good. I have to say. Um, mm-hmm. And I think they're both, no offense to Three Bears, but I like both of ours better than the Three Bears. The Three Bears was a little, as I said in the earlier show, a little too clean, <laughs> you know, like they, mm-hmm. they they weren't adventurous enough, in my opinion, sure. yeah. uh, where the flavor, if you just closed your eyes, I'm not sure that you could tell too much, you know, that it was a brown brownish beer. Mm-hmm. Um, but both of ours, there's a caramely... Uh, flavor that I like and and what I was after in the recipe. Right. Yeah. Totally. I totally agree. Yeah. And which is kind of that's what we've always. That's why I like this beer is because it's got that sweetness. It's got that carameliness. It's a little bit of roastiness, but none of it steps too far outside, which makes it a super approachable beer. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, and it's not even. Um, I wouldn't even go as far as to say it's like caramely even um they are i really can't i'm having a hard time distinguishing i'm closing my eyes and drinking them um and i'm having a hard time distinguishing the difference i feel like uh that the um josh your beer has more body to it and i you print the ingredients on the can so i'm looking at the ingredients as well yeah and i it almost like what do you think adds to that body that maybe I think the other beer doesn't have? I assume you guys are around the same percentage of corn. I mean, I, I'm at like twenty percent mm. corn. Yeah, that's right on. That's what it was. You guys are a little higher. Maybe that would thin it out a little bit, but it could be down to just as much as you know mash temperature and just that. I mean, I right. mash this a little bit like one fifty four ish. Oh, okay. So just to keep a little bit more more body in it. Um, but then I think if I remember, I mean you I didn't write your your recipe down, but I think we're we're really close to the recipe. Yeah, uh, it's also um pretty it's much higher in alcohol, uh yours than than ours. So I would I would oh, assume I would add a little too, yeah. I would add a little bit of body, some sweetness maybe. Mm-hmm. And and you guys have is- you guys have keg fills. Uh, so you probably don't have the, I, I'm not noticing that much of a difference in, in body between the two I have, but I yeah. probably lost some carbonation in yours, you know, when right. I put them in the bottle. So maybe, you mm-hmm. know, if you had the la- the level of carbonation that I have, maybe it wouldn't be as dramatic a difference. Sure. Yeah. What did the, what did the ABV in yours come out to be? Uh, 5.1. Do you want to hear the recipe? We could sure. we could remind people of the recipe. Is oh, it, you got it, you got it up to five. Yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. Because I'm looking at uh, the original recipe, and we have it at four point three. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So, it turned into <laughs> Christopher Walken there. <laughs> wow. <yeah>. Wow. <laughs> uh, this is a five gallon or nineteen liter batch. <clears throat> Eight pounds or three point six kilograms of American two row. Two pounds or 900 grams of flaked maize. So it's a little less than 20% because we've got a little bit yeah. more. Eight mm-hmm. ounces or 227 grams of crystal 120. And then three mm-hmm. ounces or 85 grams of black malt. And oh. then uh, 18 grams of German Northern Brewer at 11.4% alpha acid for 60 minutes. And that's all the hops. And then uh, L26 Pilgrimage from Imperial Original gravity 1047, final gravity 1008 uh, at 5.1% alpha acid or ABV. Uh, yeah. 158 calories, according to the calculator I used. And uh, you didn't, I don't, like you mentioned it briefly in the video, but uh, neither one of you picked up on it. And I don't know if you're picking up on it now, but you get any of that oak and bourbon, right? Was it bourbon? Oh, that that's right. Yeah. yeah. If I turn the page, <laughs> a couple turn days page. into fermentation, uh, I put uh, a small oak spire, uh, not spire, spiral. <laughs> I made the same, oh. same mistake in the uh, in the uh, video. In the video. Uh, a small um, oak spiral with enough bourbon to soak into that. Uh, spiral. So that may be where I'm getting the, the earthiness that or that I'm tasting as well. That may be just a teeny bit of oak that's peeking through that that tasted alone 
I didn't get much of. But next to yours, Josh, I think I am. Maybe that's the earthiness yeah. that, that I'm tasting. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's the the differing aroma that I get out of yours can totally be that oak. I mean, it's not that much. And it wasn't in there, but, you know, just a couple of days because I brewed mm -hmm. this and, and like kegged it a, a week later. <laughs> so it was a no chill. I didn't mention but that. But you would imagine because you, you had soaked the um, the oak in the bourbon. So that would have stripped a lot of that oak flavor off of it. Right. Because then you added everything. But the, yeah, then I poured the bourbon right. and the spiral. Mm -hmm. I almost called the spire again uh, into the into the beer. But it wasn't that much. You know, yeah, it wasn't that much liquid in the spire roll was not that big, but I think it is side by side. I think it does make enough to where, you know, if you taste an unoaked version, it's enough to, you know, it's subtle, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's subtle, but doing them side by side, I think it it shows itself more. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I like that. I is that something you would ever consider doing uh, with this Kentucky common? Would you ever barrel age it? Uh, I, so I have, I haven't barrel aged it, but I've done kind of like, not quite an imperial version, but about a 7% version and mm -hmm. then put, um, like the same kind of, you know, oak spiral with bourbon and, uh, some vanilla in it. Mm, yeah. And that's a really good version of this beer. I think I'm going to try and do that for, um, just a, a, like a, I'll pull one barrel of it off the next time I I make it and put it in a little fermenter and do that again because it's it's a really tasty version. Yeah, I'm just I was just thinking it could really uh, it has it's a good base for something else. Definitely, yeah. You know, so Josh, uh, on your recipe, what is how does the amount of say dark crystal malt uh, compare to our recipe? You have a little bit more crystal and a little bit less dark malt. So I I basically am at like a percent and a half of I use Carafa three and then Simpsons extra dark crystal, which is I think like a hundred and twenty. I think it's about the same, like 120, 150. Hmm. At what percent did you do the uh dark crystal? Like a percent and a half of both oh. that and the carafa. So for wow. me, in a five barrel batch, it comes out to like five pounds, which seems like nothing in a yeah. two hundred. And then with the carafa, that's a debittered one, right? So it, mm -hmm. you're not. So I think um, there, it would be less. I guess I don't want to use the word astringent, but uh, it would have less of that like black malt character that we yeah. have in ours. Yeah, for sure. Mm. But somehow the same color. I know. So, so strange. Yeah. Very interesting. And most of the recipes, I think, if I can remember, that I looked at were not using a crystal malt that was that dark. You know, the 120. Yeah. In fact, Matt was kind of worried that we'd get, you know, like a lot of dark fruit characters. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that didn't concern me. In fact, I was, you know, kind of wanting to lean in that direction. You yeah. know, just to kind of dirty it up a little bit or, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And be a little more it's rustic. That, it's that, you know, that little percentage, it's hard for that those dark fruit characters of that really to carry through with that little. But it, you get the notes of it, which I think is kind of what works in this beer. It's almost like a amber ale without the hops. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Well, I think I think both are good. I. I'm I'm leaning towards yours, Josh, I'm, and I'm not doing that yeah. just to be nice, but I think it's a little more polished. Uh -huh. um, but, Ooh. You, but another question: Did you use um, a lager or an ale yeast? So for this, I used um, just a chico, like a oh, okay, oh okay. Well, I mm. well I used a lager yeast, but I, I fermented it uh, at uh, ale temperature. So mm -hmm. um, I've, I mean, I've done this beer with. Kvike, I've done it with lager oh, wow. yeast. Done it with. I mean, I've done it with a bunch of different yeasts over the years, just to see. Um, it as a Kvike beer, it comes out really good. Even if you get a little bit of that orangey character, mm -hmm. like Hornendal, uh, it works still in this beer. Um, you know, there were times when I was the brewer as that before was a one barrel uh, little brew pub, so you know. Two kegs of beer doesn't last all that long in a 
r- rural Wisconsin bar. So <laughs> yeah, in the winter time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there were times where I was like, well, we need to we need to turn these things around like right now. So um, I really got familiar with using Quake on a lot of beers, and I'm amazed the beers you can make that you would never know it's a Quake beer. You know, it's 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 a really interesting yeast to use. Yeah. Man, I, I can't I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, your speaking up, Josh, and and for sending uh, sharing these beers. And I can't I I can't tell you how relieved I am that mine doesn't suck in comparison, or ours, Matt, <laughs> it doesn't suck in comparison to yours. Uh, even though yours is better, it's not. No offense, it's not. I don't think it's tremendously better. I'm like I'm oh, like. No, your beer your beer is really good. Yeah. I, I mean. I know you you said you were nervous to send it, but you shouldn't be. This is this is a really tasty beer. Well, excellent. Boy. Our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly from Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont, are now selling mead, homebrew, equipment kits, and ingredient kits. They have both one gallon and five gallon equipment kits with everything you need to make delicious mead successfully at home. And they also have one or five gallon ingredient kits for Valkyrie's Choice or Veneer. This is a great way to get into mead making for yourself, or even better, you can get a friend into mead making in the best way possible. In the equipment kits, you get fermenters, sanitizer, a hydrometer, an auto siphon, a bottle capper, and more, everything you need except for the bottles themselves, and I know how you can get those. Just drink beer or or mead or wine. The Strong Mead Equipment Kit even includes a corker. I ordered the one-gallon veneer ingredient kit, along with a case of, a case of delicious, ready-made Gronfell and Havoc meads to sample while I'm waiting for mine to be ready. Just, I know it's a sacrifice. <laughs> I can't wait. Just go to Gronfell.com and click on the homebrew link to see the new homebrew equipment kits and ingredient kits. That's at family-owned and operated Grunfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. We have a uh, uh, we have a task. If you're if you if you've got time to join us, Josh. For sure, yeah. This yeah, is yeah. another first. We haven't done you know a guest uh, participant in the recipe formulation segment. Uh, but Matt, you want to brew a beer and tell us what you want to brew. Yeah, so I thought um, – I think I just watched a video or saw something or an article came through one of the magazines, talked about Christmas beers and holiday beers. And uh, I, you know, I didn't – I was like, I have to have a beer on tap because I'm I'm pretty wiped out here. Uh, and my, my parents are coming to town and, you know, I'm like, I should probably put something on tap that, you know, should be like relatively festive. Um, if I'm going to do anything. And so I thought um, for this round, since it's the holidays are coming up, uh, I'm, if I have, if I got to brew it this weekend um, and it'll be ready for Christmas day. Yeah. I want to do a, a holiday beer. So, so holiday slash Christmas slash winter beers. Yeah. You know, it can be open to interpret. You can brew whatever you want. <laughs> right. And I, um, yeah, I was at a, I, I mentioned I was at a brewery yesterday and it was like I had all these ideas and I, I wrote down this I have this big, you know, what do I what do you call it? I have a big whiteboard, but it's paper. Oh, flip chart. <laughs> flip chart. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of paste, you know, I, I record myself on my uh phone so I don't look like an idiot to myself while I'm walking around talking to myself. And I <laughs> write down all these ideas uh of flavors of what what I remember in my childhood for Christmas time. That's what I, that was my task that I tasked myself. Um, and so I just wrote down all of the foods that I associate personally with the holidays and then kind of extrapolated flavors from those foods and then categorize those flavors that would make sense together. Um, and then put them against like styles that I thought would be interesting and not just like your standard, you know, barley wine, stout, porter, et cetera. Um, so I try to even mess around with style as well, just to kind of give it, you know, a special holiday, you know, flair to it. So you actually want, you know, like, for instance, Sierra Nevada, uh, you know, celebration ale yeah. is is a is a holiday, you know, winter, you know, beer that's just a big, 
delicious IPA. Uh, right. you, you actually want to integrate some, you know, sort of holiday flavors in there. That was my thought. Yeah, it was a, that was the simplest thought I had. And and uh, we've been trying, you know, since I'm, I'm I'm from the South Jersey, Philadelphia area, and I've moved to Colorado. And so uh, we have sort of lost a lot of our family traditions when it comes to food out here because my family's not here. And so I kind of thought as a story, I would go back to my childhood and think about the the foods that I had back on the East Coast and bring that here. That was mm. kind of my idea, right? Um, and some of those foods that I came up with are foods that everyone's going to relate with. You know, I had, you know, like hot chocolate. There's eggnog, mm. cider, cinnamon. Um, for us, every Christmas morning, we used to have a tradition where we'd make Belgian waffles. Oh. So I really kind of stuck to that one because that felt specific to me. Um I personally love candy canes and mint. Uh, I love, so I, this is sort of a new tradition, I should say, uh, even though it might not be. But you know how people like those orange and chocolate thingies? Oh, mm-hmm. where you break them, you bang them on the table? Yeah, that. Yeah. so I never had that, but I do love Negronis, and I can I I like consider those a, a holiday drink, even though I drink them year-round. But just because I guess it's red and orange, I, I kind of associate it with that. So I wrote that down marshmallows, gingerbread. Mm. Um, another, uh, if you can tell from my last name, um, a little bit Italian. <laughs> and uh, my grandmother used to make these things called pizzelles. Ooh. And I I hated them growing up <laughs> uh, because I didn't like anise or star anise or fennel flavor. I think now I'm a little bit, you know, like I didn't like biscotti either. Um, but now I'm sort of like accepting of that. So there was that sort of flavor as well. Um, which then I've been drinking a lot of chai because it's been the winter. So I, and that those have similar flavors and then Christmas tree, mm. we used to crack a lot of nuts, you know, the, the nutcracker stuff. Um, and so those are kind of the foods that I just wrote down and thought, all right, you know, what kind of flavors can I extrapolate from those like meals to kind of like build a flavor wheel in a sense. So, so jo- I know this is Matt's beer, but Josh, what, when you think of winter slash Christmas slash you know holiday beers, what comes to mind? For me, I've never been the biggest fan of the spiced, you know, the winter warmer kind mm-hmm. of spiced ales. But like a cranberry orange pale ale or a cranberry orange like a, a brown ale, I think would be good. Um, and then sort of that, I I would drift it more towards like. Like when Matt said peppermints, like a peppermint stout, a peppermint chocolate stout would be a super fun beer. Um, I think something like, you know, when you mentioned uh, cider, Mm -hmm. I think if you did something like an apple ale or like a, a, you know, like a graph, I think they were originally called in whatever Stephen King book that came from. Oh, Dark Tower. Yes, that's it. Uh, I've made a few of those over the years too. And those are really fun to have on tap. You can, you know, you can easily do sort of a mulled cider version, you know, with some cinnamon and and nutmeg and stuff that could be fun. And that you could do, you could serve that hot or, you know, hot or cold, which might be kind of fun too. Yeah. Really get wild and put a poker in it. Who knows? Mm. Yeah. Well, I actually, I have a poker and I'm I'm doing it Thursday. (laughs) Yeah. My, um, the the brewery down the street for me does a hot beer fest uh, every year. So, uh, but I so I bought one to have to do here at my house. Oh, that's super fun for yeah. for Thursday. Yeah. So I'm just uh, I'm gonna borrow some glassware from them because I don't know if my glassware is gonna stand up to a uh, scorching hot uh, <laughs> poker in cold beer. I don't. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, I I took. I took those like all of those things and some of the things that you had mentioned as well. And I, I broke them down into like flavor groups that I thought would would pair well. And then I challenged myself to think of styles outside of the traditional ones. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and, and I have three and I'm not set on these by any means, but I just wanted to uh, put them out there and see what your thoughts were. So I, um, Broke them down into flavors. So the flavor uh, categories I came up with were, and then I put a, 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 a major um, category name. So I did, I have three of them. One was peppermint bark. So doing mint and chocolate and then like white chocolate or like vanilla. Um, So that was one. 
The other one was gingerbread. So having like, mm. and I, I put orange and ginger and even spruce and cinnamon and vanilla and honey and salt all kind of in there. Mm-hmm. Um, See, and that, then for, that's, that's, that's fruitcake. That's fruitcake territory. That's you're sneaking into that. <laughs> right there, yeah. yeah. Right. Th- yeah. I'm right on the line. And then there's, uh, I did like, I want it maple syrup because I, the Belgian waffle thing really just kind of like hit for me. Um, so like maple, oak, vanilla, nutmeg, mm-hmm. cinnamon, lactose, brown sugar, oh. that sort of area. Um, oh. so then what I did was I wrote down a bunch of styles, but then I tried to think of styles that I like I've like either never brewed or wanted to push the boundaries of. And so I, I, I paired each one with a, with a style and let me know what you think of any of these. So peppermint bark, black IPA. I could, totally, only, I could totally work. Yeah. So the only reason I thought for that, cause I'm, I'm a little nervous about peppermint using peppermint. So have you used peppermint? Any, any of you? I can't remember. <laughs> I have, I don't know. It's whatever wild mint grows outside my back door that I can't kill. So you used actual <laughs> mint. I did, yeah. Did you dry uh, it out or cuz I'm worried about the oils? I didn't. I just oh, went okay. like leaves in I I've, it's been a long time but I believe it was right at the end of the boil and just sort of steeped it. Okay. As as it chilled down. Did it uh, come out pepperminy? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. But getting the right level was a complete guess. Crap shoot, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I thought the reason I picked black IPA is is because you know, peppermint has like a bite to it, but mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to get that if you were to just steep leaves or do any sort of dried, or even if you use an extract, but you could get that bite from the hops, right? If you made like it, if you made it bitter and then adding a little bit of vanilla to kind of, you know, amplify the white chocolate part of the bark yep. would be, sounds like it would be interesting and kind of more in the milkshake IPA territory. I think it could for sure be, yeah, that could work for sure. And there's, um, uh, is it a hop call? Is it Glacier? Is that Maybe? the minty one? Yep. That might be a fun a fun way to kind of you know pull. And there's your there's your winter connection too. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, yeah, with the All name. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of curious. I'm ca- kind of curious though. I mean, to like a lot of mint, like peppermint, uh, or you know, or spearmint, you get kind of a mentholy adjacent yeah. thing. So you know that. I would be a little concerned that too much mint might, you know, kind of conflict with a big hoppiness of the beer. That might I'd... be one where you could almost dry hop with it. Oh, good. And, R- right. And if it's not enough, you can always double dry hop it, you know, and then you can sell it for more. <laughs> yeah. So I, you're right. <laughs> I think, uh, so I have a dehydrator. I could dehydrate mint leaves at a high temperature just to kill off any, you know, bugs that might be on it or or anything, and then dry hop with dried mm-hmm. peppermint. Okay. That could work. You could also do a tincture, you know, if you did a tincture with Everclear or vodka, yeah. mm-hmm. or vodka. Could, it's a little more dosable then too. So that was, that was one idea. The other idea was uh, a gingerbread imperial wit. That's funny. I as soon as you said gingerbread, I wrote down wit. Yeah, because I'm like, because be really you know, with the yeast, there's your cloves. Um, you can you're gonna obviously there's orange. Uh, you you know you could do cinnamon. You could do it's got wheat in it, so it's gonna be you know the mouthfeel will be good. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought to make it imperial, you could throw honey or use honey malt to mm-hmm. kind of amplify that. Yeah. Uh, if you yeah. want, if I. If I went really wanted to go crazy, I could hop it, like dry hop it to get more of a spruce character if I wanted to throw that out there or salt it a little bit to kind of, you know, kind of go into like the, it's not sour, but like the Goza territory. That, that's an interesting, that's an interesting idea too. That was when I came up with that, when I, th- when I thought of that, I was like, and, or, and also ginger as well. I think that would go well because yeah. uh, obviously gingerbread, but that one I was like, Ooh, that sounds fun. That sounds like a fun experiment that I was like, I would drink that if that worked. If it <laughs> worked, yeah. Like a, yeah. And, you know. e- and even if you got some some of the banana from the yeast as well as clove, yeah, uh, right. That would go with the gingerbread as as well. Exactly. So I feel like that would and I and I, and does it have to be imperial? I don't know, but I figured if we're doing a winter warmer yeah. type of, you know, why not jack that up a little bit? 
Um, then the final one was kind of going off the pancake maple syrup, uh, or not pancake, but like Belgian waffle vibes, which was doing an imperial brown ale with maple, oak, vanilla, nutmeg, cinnamon, maybe some lactose if we want. To, I don't think we have to go that far. Um, brown sugar to kind of amplify the uh, imperialness of it. Um, and so that was that felt more that that one feels like the most Christmassy or the most like holiday spiced one. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's but, but it's figured, also kind of almost been done, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's kind of like yeah, you, yeah. It sounds delicious, but I'm pretty sure I've had one. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. So that was, and then there's obviously like you could do like a hot chocolate. Like that's why I avoided like hot chocolate stout, which is like that's been done, obviously. Um, uh, or like a Christmassy, or like a spruce beer. You know, like you could do mm-hmm. a light sprucey beer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why I kind of was leaning towards, uh, you know, doing something that may, may not work, which I think the black IPA has a chance of it not coming out very good, but the gingerbread wit, I feel like, I don't know how that could go bad. <laughs> I mean, I say that. I kind of, I kind of like the gingerbread wit. It I, sounds like a cool idea. I, I, I agree. I'm I'm leaning towards gingerbread wit. Honestly. Yay! <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. Okay. So so open okay. up your app. I uh, it's open. Let's it's open. Let's get let's get started. What's our base? All right. Well, half two row, half wheat. That's right. Yeah, I would start there. I would start pilsner and wheat. But it, pilsner. It's a, it's a horse apiece at that point. You know, it's just it's not going to make that big of a difference in the in the final right product. Uh, have you? So the thing I go back and forth on, and I've I I don't know. I want to ask: Do you think it should be flaked wheat or malted wheat? For mm-hmm. wheat, I almost always use malted wheat. And why do you do that over flaked wheat? Out of curiosity, one ease of use. Uh huh. Um, I don't think the flavor is that different because you're not getting a ton of flavor out of wheat anyway. And for me. Even when I was homebrewing, you put a bunch of flaked anything in a beer and it's going to turn gummy. You know, it's just going to be, you just have more of a chance of something going weird. But I feel like you don't get as much of that with malted wheat. And malted wheat's going to bring its own enzymes to the party as well. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So uh, I just, for for my system, um, I just put in five pounds of each and I got like 4.6%. Obviously, that's without doing mash, and that's out with, without doing uh, yeast. But is there anything else that you would throw into a wit beer? Like, would you do oats, flaked oats? You could. I mean, if you really want to get it a little more, I think that would give you a little more body, a little more mouthfeel, and maybe that flavor when you're you you start to mix the kind of the baking grains, uh huh, wheat, flat wheat, oats. I think that could totally work. Yeah. How. So like I like ten percent you're thinking or twenty percent? Oh, I think ten would probably be yeah 20. good enough. Yeah. Do we? Does it make sense to make this imperial or do we not make an imperial? It depends on how hard your family is to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> if it's if it's high in alcohol, they're probably if not. My wife ever hears this, she'll shoot me. Good thing she no, <laughs> yeah, she'll ever listen to this. <laughs> um, it's kind of cliche to to go with a higher alcohol for a holiday beer. Right. Uh, but you know it is a special you know special occasion um so maybe you know halfway in between just a moderately high alcohol beer maybe okay um do you think i should so right now we're sitting at roughly five percent do you think adding instead of adding more malt going with like a honey or something to kind of to boost it or or maybe a different kind of sugar that might add a little bit to the gingerbreadiness of it i wonder what like a molasses would do would that make it dark? Yeah, It'd make it darker. It yeah. yeah, that's true. But maybe like maybe a honey malt or honey malt might not be a bad play in that beer. Yeah, because I don't know if I... you want to use if you use honey, honey, it's gonna dry. You know, you're mm. gonna lose a lot of your. Yeah, it's, it's gone. Gonna dry that beer out some. Yeah, but maybe a honey malt could could work. That if I added another pound of that. That brings it about five point four percent. Maybe another pound of your base malt. Yeah, just to boost it a little, just a little bit more. 
All right, 5.8% if I boost. Uh, let me just do one more pound of the wheat, wheat as well. All right, 6.3%. Yeah, that that's sounds good. good. Uh, yeah, that that right. feels about right. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. so we got six pounds of uh, Pilsner, six pounds of white wheat malt, one pound of honey malt, and one pound of flaked oats. Yeah. Sound pretty good? I think, yeah. I think and so. that honey malt really adds a lot of color. So it, it um, you know, that gives us almost a seventh SRM, which I don't know if we want to, I mean, it's, it's almost looking like, like the color of orange juice hmm. as opposed to like the really light, you know, white wit beer style. Maybe cut that back by half, you know, to a half a pound, maybe. You could. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you definitely could. Cause I, All if right. it stays hazy, which a wit yeast probably will. Yep. You know, it's, it's a fine line from a really pretty orange to a really muddy brown. <laughs> Right. So I, I think cutting it back was good. It's a, it's right now we have it sitting at exactly 6%. So that, that yeah, feels perfect. right. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. As far as hops are concerned, uh, is there any hop that you're familiar with that would play up any of the flavors of like orange or ginger or honey even? I feel like Cascade always gives me that. And then um, I know people talk about Amar- Amarillo uh, yep. being orangey. Mm-hmm. That could, um, that could work. I mean, Citra seems to always be the answer for everything, but I think Citra could do a little bit of that too. You know what? I think I have a lot of Citra and Cat. I actually, you know what I have? I have fresh homegrown Cascade. Mm. Well, that'd be fun. I mean, it's always nice to tell people you you grew the hops in there. So yeah, okay. I will. Uh, I will do throw one ounce of that in the beginning of the boil, and that gets us to twenty i twenty IBUs, which is probably good enough for that. Of course, you live in Colorado, uh, so you know I, I, you know my homegrown hops. I never depended on them for the bitterness, uh, right? You know, in anything, uh, but you You're may right, have probably shouldn't. You may have better luck, you know, in your climate than I did. I mean, I, I also have pellets of of Cascade, so um, I could do a pellet, uh, one ounce of Cascade at sixty minutes, and then do my, uh, um, my like aroma hops at flame out or something. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a solid plan. Yeah. I, I would do that just, just to be sure. Cause you, you don't know exactly what your hops have. Um, it, you're right. Um, so I'll just do that at flame out. Plus okay, you want to cool. feed, you want to feature um, them. So. Yeah, for sure. So other than that, um, I think there's only one type of yeast to use, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with imperial <laughs> what's the what is the imperial version is that um white out and and white out uh, produces an excellent balance of spicy phenolic character and esters uh so perfect for belgian wits and other light colored belgian ales josh do you do much with uh water chemistry at your brewery uh yeah i do what do you think would fit well with this style i would i would go high on calcium chloride in okay. in this in a wit okay like would you go like like a like a hazy style like that high yep, yep i would like how far do you go ppm wise on a, on calcium chloride like where's your where do you top out at normally oh you know off the top of my head um i well ratio wise i usually stick to like four to one whoa really um, yeah for hazies i and who knows i don't know I'm no Scott Janish. I don't know all the science sure. and everything, but um, I find like that's what helps my beer get hazy and stay hazy is a way is a is a pretty high chloride, you know, calcium chloride addition. Um, but I think pH has something to do with that too. Uh-huh. I could go down a whole rabbit hole where I'm. I had one hazy that all of a sudden just decided to clear out. Like the third batch we made of it just decided I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> and people would ask me why. I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special issue. It is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. Limited edition, clear hazy. Uh-huh. <laughs> clear hazy. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, there's something might there. Be, that might be some marketing we could do there. <laughs> uh, do you think there's any room for salt? Depends on what's in your water. So the water we you, we have in St. Paul, I typically add a little bit of Epsom salt to. 
Yeah, we yeah we. Um, I my my water's RO, so I'm starting okay. with nothing. Yeah. yeah. Then then I think I think I would. I'm just trying to pull up uh, the brewing water calculator quick and just see kind of what what it what it says. I've I've always been fairly fairly impressed with this calculator. So mm-hmm. if I do a um a ratio of it's uh, it's about three to one. No, uh, no, it's like two to one. I could go a little bit higher on that. Um, that gives me, you know, 10 grams of calcium chloride in a five gallon batch, uh, three grams of Epsom, three grams of gypsum. I could lower the gypsum a little bit or even not put any in. No, I, th- I think you're probably, I mean, I think that sounds pretty decent really. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then do you, do you mash this high? Do you mash it lo- like normal 150, maybe go a little lower? Like what do you normally do for a whip? You think? I mean, I think you could go pretty, pretty normal. Uh, I don't think it needs to be super high. I mean, I think that water, the that that much chloride in your water is going to soften it up enough uh-huh. that you don't need the super high mash up. I think if you just went a normal, you know, 150, 152, I think you'd be good. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, besides that, it's about adding the adjuncts. The one idea that I had about that, um, that I had written down was to, add to kind of do like what you would do in a hazy IPA and, you know, drop, I know James, you've done where you've dropped the temperature to like 180 mm-hmm. um, after flame out mm-hmm. or even maybe lower to like 160. And then that's when I would add fresh ingredients. So I would do fresh ginger, fresh um, like cinnamon sticks, uh, coriander seed, um, uh, fresh uh, orange peel, and let it kind of just steep for like 30 minutes at that lower temperature. Mm-hmm. Does that, does that make sense or is that overkill? Uh, no, I think it totally makes sense. I mean, if, you, if you're going to put the stuff in there anyway, and you've got the ability to go down where you're not going to just steam off half the aromatics you're trying to catch. Yeah. Why not? And then I guess it's a guess on like how much to add. I'm just <laughs> like, do, do you yes. think there, you know, like, I've always worried about adding too much, um, you know, like when I would do these beers in the past, I would, I'm like, you know, they would, they would tell you to max out it like, you know, for a five gallon batch, one ounce of say like coriander seed. And I'm like, I kind of want a ton more. Like, and I always feel yeah. like I under, I under spice it or, and I under like under, you know, don't put enough orange peel in it that I barely get those flavors when I'm drinking it yeah. and they're more subtle. But in this kind of beer, I feel like it's gotta be like amped to the, like the, nth degree yeah. yeah i think you go for it you just go for it yeah i think I'm, so too i mean if it's over the top you say well it's a holiday beer right well and you could also do do your you know do that whirlpool steep but then take oh, all those same ingredients and throw them in a mason jar with some vodka and just tincture it mm. and then if mm. then you got a little bit of wiggle room at the end hmm so, if, so it's throw not, it. if it's not quite there, then you can always bump it some. And so you would do like, uh, so so are we on the same page with doing orange, ginger, cinnamon, or obviously gingerbread, but do we throw any vanilla in that? Is that vanilla going to work? I think so. I think you put like, vanilla in just because, even if it's not a ton of vanilla, it triggers your brain to to think. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Even mm. if it's not sweet. Right. Yeah, and it's it, it, okay. vanilla can be a flavor booster. I mean, they use vanilla in chocolate bars, right? Yeah, right. definitely. Yeah, and if it's at a at a you know if it's at a level where nobody's going to drink it and say, "Oh, there's vanilla in there," are are we making a milkshake wit? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, you haven't went to lactose yet, but I, I did not. No, <laughs> although I think in this style, you, I don't know, I don't know, he's going to put it in. I might. I, that's a. I'm gonna call an. Uh, well, that'll be an audible call in, in the <laughs> yeah, moment. Yeah. <laughs> do we need to discuss how much, or do you think I should just go nuts with the ingredients? I think it's gonna be one of those things on the day where I'm just gonna have to add and stir, and then like literally take sips of the wort and just kind of go. Is this and and smell it kind of away from the you know kettle and just go. Is this enough? Do I feel like this is enough? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah. if it's not, I got time. I just keep adding more and steeping more until like, cause I figured, you know, like with apple cider, if you're going to do like a hot apple cider and you would put oranges with cloves in it, it's like, you can't really overdo that. Right. Yeah. You know? And I kind of feel like with this, it's like, it's going to be really hard to overdo, especially orange. And if it's at, uh, you know, like cinnamon, sure, you could over, I guess you could overdo it, but I don't, if I do sticks, then I could at least take it out if it's too much, right. you know, yeah. where if I add it with powder, then yeah, I'm kind of like, I'm pot committed at that point. <laughs> yeah. Powder. Yeah. That's a, I, sticks, I think is the way to go. Powder seems yeah. like. And it's fresher theoretically to go with sticks. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So doing fresh orange peel, fresh ginger. Um, and I'll probably just do like, you know, like I'll peel the ginger and just do like knobs at a time or like coins or something mm -hmm. instead of grating it. And again, having that same problem where I'm like, Oh no, I've overdone it with the ginger and I can't get it out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping everything where you can pull it is right. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. All right. So is that the I beer? I think that's the beer. Wow. We just got to name it. Oh, you're good at that. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought of it. Yeah, I'll give me give me time on that one. I'll come yeah, up with something. You you named the Arkansas porch steamer, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My pre-prohibition American lager, or classic American pilsner, if you like, that uh, Chris Colby of Beer and Gardening Journal dot com and I designed is in the keg. And it's tasting pretty good. It's tasting delicious. I fermented it with the L26 Pilgrimage from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Yeast. I followed all the lager rules with this one. I dusted off my stir plate and made a two-liter starter, which was done in a day, thanks to the 200 billion cells in the easy-to-open package of Imperial Pilgrimage. I chilled to lager temperature, aerated with oxygen, and did a diacetyl rest after fermenting in the kegerator. It's been in the keg for two weeks, and it's clearing very nicely. Desiree and Dave tasted it and said it said it was good while they were here. Uh, the next seasonal yeast coming from Imperial is L25 Huga, clean and crisp lager yeast from Northern Europe that we've had great results with. I'm getting good at lagers, getting good at lagers. <laughs> I'm getting more confident with all this wonderful lager yeast from Imperial. L25 Huga will be available December 4th. So ask your local homebrew store to get you some, and you can check out all the dependable deliciousness at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. It's time for a, a bonus beer, I think. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to walk next door to my keg, and I'll be right back with another one of Josh's beers. This has actual coffee in it. Yep. Yep. So so I'm gonna it has caffeine. Uh negligible. Okay. It's at least it's at least what I've been told by the, the coffee guys that we get our coffee from. Because mm -hmm. it's all the way we do the way I do the coffee is I just hang whole coffee beans in the bright tank. Like in a bag? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so they're in there for like thirty six hours. So and, yeah, so you don't you don't crack them or anything. Oh, you you just yeah. So we don't get it. You know, we don't get any of the color out of it. We don't get you get all the aroma kind of, but not. I don't think uh -huh. you know, maybe there's a little bit of caffeine, but not enough that right. You know, we're not making energy drinks, unfortunately. No, I was hoping for the caffeine a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like two o'clock pick me up. I love the label. It's a it's a skeleton holding a cup of coffee. He's sitting in a hammock. And there's a uh, there's a cooler nearby, and it, there's a fire, and there's a meteor in the sky, and there's a, there's the moon up above. After hours barista, coffee nice. blonde ale with pilsner, flaked oats, and Kara eight, five percent alcohol by volume. Hops warrior with Costa Rican coffee, twenty two IBUs. It's a beautiful beer. It's got an orange it hue. Really is, yeah. What what is the um what is Kara eight? So Kara eight is made by Dingemans out of Belgium. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's just like an eight level bond crystal. So it keeps oh, okay. it pretty pretty low. But I I like the I use it in a few beers. I like the flavor I get out of it. It's not caramely. It's just it's kind of like super carapils, where it gives you a little bit of that sweetness in the back, but doesn't 
stand in the way of anything else. This is delightful. Yeah. What's the ro- what's the roast level of the uh, the beans, the coffee beans? It's just a just a medium roast. Um, okay. Just just kind of a middle of the road Costa Rican coffee, but. We have some friends that that work at a place called BW Coffee in in St. Paul that they are they're a coffee roaster that they kind of supply all of the coffee shops that want to sell their own brands. So if you go to a little coffee shop and they have their their logoed coffee, most likely they're not roasting it all on site. So BW will kind of do some of that for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've had a really good relationship over them. We actually, I just put an espresso machine in the tap room at Gambit, uh, three weeks ago, maybe. So we're doing some espresso stuff in the tap room too. Um, and they've been super good to work with. So when we wanted to do this beer, when I did it at the previous brewery in the one barrel, I would just sort of cycle through whatever local coffee I chose. But I've landed on this Costa Rican. I really like the way it comes through in this beer. So, yeah, kind of it's not like sipping on a cup of coffee, but there no. there is a hint of coffee and there's a coffee fruitiness in there. Yeah, uh, that really complements the style and is really nice. Um, mm-hmm. It's I think it was a uh, Bentonville uh, Brewing Company that did a. Uh, like a coffee IPA, and they worked with a local roaster to roast a certain uh, variety of coffee mm-hmm. in a certain way that brought out the fruitiness of of the bean. Yeah. And that's, you, you know, it's been a long time since I had that. But this is a similar experience where, like I say, it's not like drinking a cup of coffee. No. Y- you know, if you handed this to somebody and, you know, said, what do you think? Th- maybe not maybe they wouldn't come up with coffee on the one of the first adjectives but it is, but it yeah. is in there on the second and third yeah, it's on like, the aroma for sure yeah, it's like yeah. wow that's really that's really nice the the thing that i kind of like about it is you know when you're a kid you don't like coffee but when you walk through that coffee aisle at the grocery store yeah mm-hmm. it smells amazing mm-hmm. that's kind of what this beer does for me is like it you get that coffee aisle aroma to it and it you don't it's not bitter it's not like drinking a cup of coffee but it's like the other side of coffee that kind of gets blown out when you run it through your mr coffee at least my mr coffee yeah i i also feel like it's not very bitter no and no if no, it super intentionally yeah to keep right, it because if it was you would i think the coffee it would scream coffee even more yeah right because yeah. you would have that like bitter flavor after you smelled it and you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. But now it's like you smell the coffee, but then what you said, James, is a very fruity yeah. uh, on the palate. And my nose doesn't work as well as it used to. So <laughs> you guys are probably getting more of the coffee aroma than uh, than I am. But I'm definitely getting the flavor of, like I say, the the kind of fruity notes of, of coffee, not the, you know, kind of bur- burnt toast kind of, yeah. you know, coffee. Uh, like when you drink a cup of coffee, uh, but mm-hmm. it's but it's those fruity notes uh, from the coffee that really come through uh, in the beer. That's way good. I'm I'm glad I didn't yeah, know it was good. that good. It wouldn't have lasted this long if I'd known it was this good. <laughs> <laughs> there was only one can. Yeah, exactly. You got to savor. <laughs> oh, I have a weird question. But uh, did you end up taking the beans and then re drying them and then roasting them as coffee? I haven't yet, but I'm going to. Okay. Because I wonder I if, uh, if it's... I have all this coffee that is all wet, but I think if I dried it back out, either it's going to be really good or it's going to be god awful. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe that's. <laughs> I would think the sweetness would linger on the on the bean from the wort, yeah. and then I don't know. It would depend on on how you dried it. I think. If you dried it, 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 you know, if it's got a lot of, well, it wouldn't have a lot of sugar because if it's in finished beer. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you like roasted it again, it might have a different uh, uh, perception as if you like dehydrated it at a lower temperature. That's true. Yeah. I would, yeah, go old school and let it sit out in the sun. Mm. Well, this has been delightful. We're, uh, we're, we're a little over time, but, you know, that's okay. That'll uh, happen. Uh, this has been great. Um, mm-hmm. 
I'm 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 in, incredibly uh, flattered, uh, Josh, that you reached out and the, and that you sent us your beer, and and I'm incredibly again relieved that uh, you know y'all y'all think the beer that I brewed is okay, and uh, and then uh, you know the bonus beer was is just uh, icing on the cake, and then the yeah. and then Matt, your your recipe I think is going to be killer. I, I do hope too. so. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Hope so. Well, guys, excellent. This has been, uh, I think, a, a, a good uh, first uh, experiment in the the trifecta of the uh, <laughs> of the of the uh, recipe development series. Uh, you, you know, having a guest on, I think it worked. I think it worked well. I mean, I think bringing a pro on, yeah, to help us, you know, craft homebrew recipes. I think that's a smart. That's a that's a fun play. Yeah. Well, if you, I would, I would totally be down to do it going like again first for sure i mean you know i i started home brewing in like oh one when there was there was nothing out there really yeah and then i mean shit, i've listened to basic brewing for how long have you been doing this james uh like, it, i mean it's been a our, long time when our 18th year mm-hmm. yeah, 2005. or no 19th year yeah yeah started in uh 2005 so yeah so i've probably been been there Nearly the entire time. I mean, I had the basic bring log book wow. for, that I used mm-hmm. for a long time. And, you know, so it's for me, it's, it's, this is cool. And if I can give some of that back to the people that are kind of coming up, then it's great. You know, I love it. This, cause it, you get to do some of the stuff like for me to, to, to brew even at five barrels. I'm not a big brewery by any means mm-hmm. to do five barrels of a gingerbread wit. That's, well, Maybe not gonna all move by Christmas. You know? <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. so this is it's it's fun for me to get in that you know kind of back in that homebrew mindset where you can you can soak a spiral in in bourbon and chuck all the bourbon in there and nobody from the state is gonna come. Gonna... <laughs> bourbon. What is that TFP? What do you got there? What is it? Right. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. you know. So yeah, it's it's this is great. I love it. Well, I excellent. I'm 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 flattered uh, that you've been with us for so long, Josh. And uh, uh, yeah, it's it's what it's all about. It's 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 feeding the loop, and this is yeah. how we we uh, get better beer quicker is if we all share stuff together. So I totally agree. And you know, from my side of the craft brewery side, we're in this weird we're in this weird loop right now. We're breweries that i know are making good beer going out of business because yeah. everything is so expensive and everything is crazy yeah so the more the more we get out to people i think and say hey go support your little breweries amen it may seem like they're fine but maybe they're not you know right yeah and for for us to be a year in it's mildly terrifying right now but <laughs> you know we're we're doing okay so yeah well that's good to hear yeah it's a good Gambit. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. You know. Everybody asked, like, you know, where where did we come up with the name Gambit? And that's exactly it. Like to open really? in in early 2023 or you know late 2022, it's it's a calculated risk. So, yeah. well, if you, if you keep making beers that are so delicious, and if you keep uh, plugging into your local community there, I think you'll you'll do great. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, for I sure. hope so. We're we're kind of that's what we try and focus on is, you know, keeping stuff in the community and and uh, so we'll see. We've done a little bit of stuff with the the St. Paul Homebrewers Club that's been fun. So I'd like to do a little bit of more of that stuff. So we'll see if we'll see if those guys listen to this this podcast. And... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I heard you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, Josh, Matt. Thank you so much. This has been a ton of fun. Yeah, appreciate it. It's been great. I appreciate it. Man, what a fun conversation. Josh's beers were delicious, and I'm really looking forward to tasting what Matt comes up with for his holiday beer. Check out Matt at brewcabin.com along with swimuniversity.com and the corresponding YouTube channels. And Josh is at gambitbrewingco.com. Or go by and see them in person in St. Paul. And uh, don't forget to send in your brewing disaster stories, by the way. 
If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, disaster stories, or just want to say, hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.